Okay, I'm delighted to introduce our fourth speaker, giving a 30-minute talk, YLT6's very own social media coordinator, Stephanie Sherry Ejus. Dr. Sherry Ejus teaches English at the University of Malta. She holds a doctorate in education and has been teaching for over 15 years, during which time she has also delivered numerous talks and workshops. Her ELT research interests include learner engagement, feedback practices, and material creation. Okay, take it away, Stephanie. Hi there. Uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, this is my first TED conference, actually, even though I have been giving talks uh, for quite a while now. So it's a new experience for me. Um, yes, and today I'm going to take you through my experience with um, teenage learners uh, using multimodal materials um, to encourage and enhance social cultural awareness. So of course, before I start, I'd like you to um, type in what you think, uh, what multimodal and social cultural mean to you. So you can um, type some ideas there, some definitions or thoughts, um, and even some questions that you might have later on. Um, yeah, a bit more volume. Okay, okay. Um, I am so spoken by nature, so. I need to shout a bit more. Is that better? Is that better? Is that okay? Yes? Okay, good. Okay, so my teaching experience. Um, how, how do we turn the slide, by the way? Um, is there someone to turn the slide? Because I don't know how to do that. <laughs> okay, yes. Yes, okay. I forgot. Lapses, sorry. <laughs> In my teaching experience, I come across different types of students, but one thing they have in common is their ability to navigate a world online. Now, the world online is full of disasters, tragedies, bad news, so a lot of negative things. And one can say that we are living in a very unusual age because our teens have the world at their fingertips. So they can literally access the world as they are living their daily lives to the point where there's an oversaturation of news. Okay, so um, the result is that they come to us sometimes a bit desensitized, a bit unaffected by such news, and they become detached from the world and a bit more like having a thick skin, they start lacking empathy. So apart from teaching them how to communicate and how to write in English and how to read English, I think that developing their social cultural awareness and empathy uh, is very important. And in fact, our school curricula uh, from early years up until secondary and post-secondary are emphasizing the importance of self and identity, things like citizenship, responsibility, and agency in decision making. So they are acknowledging things like harnessing empathy and growing social cultural awareness. So the question is how to engage them in the lesson in a way that they react, that they feel something, whether they are triggered um, to respond verbally or even um, in a spoken way, you know, or even written. So I think we can use something that maybe um, to allow them to become more engaged is to bring in an element of surprise, uh, something that is unexpected and different. So as you're going along in your yearly lessons, you kind of bring in that little bit of a boost in the classroom, something a bit that is not expected by students. I don't know if you agree with me, if you do type in um, basically, type in, uh, yes, that you agree that you bring in some mystery and surprise, okay? Now, together with that, we can use something that is very age-old, really, and that is the art of storytelling. Believe it or not, despite our advances in technology and science and in other areas, everyone, including students, like a good old story. So embedded in the lesson idea I created, there is a story at the core, and embedded within the idea of enhancing social cultural awareness was a story with which people, uh, students could connect on a human personal level. Okay, yeah. Uh, would it still be better to turn up the volume? 
Are you still not hearing me? Is that okay? Okay. So, um, yeah, because stories carry messages um, and they impart lessons. So managing and adapting resources and sources, which is the second point in this slide, um, is basically something you need to keep in mind, like um, doing research into necessary materials. And what I found really worked well was to channel the sources through technology. As Jen before me was saying, and other people have mentioned the use of technology, so I integrated a number of media, like images, video, and literature. Like the poem is a text, but the poem is also an event, plus the traditional handout, which I created for my students. The stimulus was not only to create a lesson for the students, but to inspire them to become co-creators and therefore to give lesson ideas by the students. Okay, so the next point is okay so now we're preparing the lesson for the lesson and we're thinking about things like aims and outcomes of the lesson stages to adopt materials right so i'm going to use this as a sample a concrete idea i think about the aims and the outcomes and the stages include pre-reading context building and um, also uh, post-reading Okay, so we really and truly these are traditional stages, but of course, the materials that are used are somehow uh, made to make the stages look a bit refreshed. Okay, so I consider the materials to use and I wanted to exploit multimodality and students love for the visuals. Right now, video is the most preferred format, but I still wanted to ensure that text is present because text is always important, especially in literature classes. So um, video is there to help, not to replace um, other media. So in connection with telling a story, I also decided to design the lesson in the form of a journey, taking students with me back in time, back in history as well, so that I could give them context as well as connect with what's happening nowadays especially um, in terms of our um, socio-political and um, how you call it, our um, social fabric in Malta. Okay, we have a situation where we have a lot of immigrants, so students are of course growing up with that new reality, but taking them back in time to something that happened historically in other countries, which might, you know, this event or set of events might not have been familiar to our students and aligning what has happened in the past uh, up to now. And this will make sense as I take you through the activities that I did with my students. All right, um, right. so it really was very um, helpful for students to be focused and for me to make sure that my students didn't get restless or weren't really distracted by other things, but were really absorbed in what we're doing. I decided to focus, to narrow down my focus on one aspect. And later on, that aspect would grow and grow until it would be a springboard for students to think of other aspects and ultimately to bring their own materials to class. Okay, so this is the lesson in stages, right? Um, so what allowed me to keep students engaged? Um, and push them to participate was to keep the lesson fluid and to keep the pace going by doing a number of short burst activities that led into each other. And by the end of the lesson, we did a lot of activities, but the focus was one, just one. And basically um, it was to allow them to have a structured approach. I feel that when students are given structure, they work best. And my students are 16 to 18 years old. We think that they are outgrown of structure, but indeed, when you tell them, when I tell them, uh, this is what we're going to do today, these are the aims, they really feel safe and anchored. And in that way, they're somehow more focused because there are so many distractions that, yeah, sometimes we need to just say, listen, this is what we're going to do today. And this is what we're going to get out of the lesson today, or so we hope. Okay, 
So um, the structure approach is also scaffolding, creating a lesson. And I actually use a very, very simple tool, which is PowerPoint. I designed all my lessons on the PowerPoint uh, as a medium. But rather than doing it as a traditional previous lecture mode, I did it as a stage of activity. But of course, students were very visually responsive to it because in, embedded in the PowerPoint were images and video and activities. So they, they were really excited to see what was coming up next. Okay, so then what happens is I do the context building to the images, to the story, and to the video. I prepared for the language to get new vocabulary and maybe language that was culturally rich because of the context. It's very important to build the context. And then while reading, we had some activities. Um, now, although fill in the gaps activities look really traditional and boring for the students, it was really fun to do and also made them think a lot, as we shall see. Then we went on to the traditional questions and non-traditional questions related to the poem and related to the topic within the text. Okay, so we took them through imagery like text and language use and symbols but also to other things then that were beyond the text, as in how does the poem make you respond to certain realities and how can it be more relevant to today's reality? Okay, so in other words, okay, this is the poem, but before that, I want to tell you a story. Are you, read, are you ready to hear the story for the context building? Did you say yes or no? <laughs> right, okay. So here goes the story. Okay, so I placed down a video. Of course, because of the format of this conference, I had to do without the video. So you'll have to just make do with me. <laughs> I played a video uh, with footage of the 1930s in the US. And the students were listening to this music, which was building up and in the background and behind my back, they were watching also the video, uh, which was just footage of a normal city going through the motions, and I was telling them the story, okay? Right, so here goes the story. Uh, bear in mind, this is a web conference, so I'm trying to make it as natural as possible. I'm going to enter my storytelling mode. The year is 1930, in Marion, Indiana. A white factory worker is attacked. His girlfriend is assaulted. The man succumbs to his injuries. But it's not long before his bloody shirt is paraded on a pole. A declaration of war that incites a lynch mob to break into the jail where the alleged assaulters are being held. Before anyone is taken to trial, two men are taken out of their jail cells. J. Thomas Shep and Abraham S. Smith. They're apprehended by the lynch mob and they're hanged. They seem guilty. Another man, actually a teen of just 16 years old, James Cameron, is nearly lynched, but manages, escape, manages to escape being killed. A photograph is taken at the scene of the lynching by Lawrence Baker, who captures the scene harrowing and surprising and shockingly enough. It is said that copies of the photograph were sold in large amounts. Seven years later, Abel Mirapol, under the pseudonym of Lewis Allen, comes across this photograph. It seems to be, you know, a mob, a crowd of people happily attending a fairy count event, a county fair event. Reading the expressions of the crowd, Mirapol, who was a Jewish chief, a Jewish English teacher from the Bronx, is somehow affected by the image because it triggers in him an emotive response, and this leads him to write the poem Strange Fruit. The poem goes beyond the written page because Mirapol decides to transform it into a song full of indignation and anger. Strange Fruit is poetic and epic in its extended metaphorical meaning. Two years later, in 1939, the poem becomes a song, and it is none other than Billie Holiday who performs it. In Cathy Society, the only or the first rather nightclub at the time to remove the restriction of segregation rules. 
And when she records it, Billie Holiday goes on to sell a groundbreaking one million copies, rendering her best selling record. This poem becomes a form of protest, a way of mouthpiece against injustices suffered by people because of their skin color. So following the narration, which truly had the effect of holding the student's attention. Actually, I did it very short, you know, with you I lengthened it a bit. But for them, I tried to keep it, you know, very, very quick, all right? I showed them photos of the era as well as those of the poet and singer. Before giving them the text, I showcased some of the language to see whether they understood the terms. And then I gave them this. So I'd like you to try and fill in the gaps. If you want some help, the first one is strange fruit. Tells his trees, right? The southern trees bear a strange fruit. Blood on the leaves and blood at the type in. Any responses you think match with fruit? Okay. Yes, black body swinging in a southern. Yes, yes, it's roots, in fact. Southern something. Strange fruit hanging from the poplar. What goes with poplar? Collocation. Poplar is a type of tree, yes. So what rhymes with trees, possibly? With trees, what rhymes with trees? Breeze, that's good, yes. Uh, okay, and pass through a scene of the gallant south. I give you this because it's a strange collocation. The bulging eyes and the twisted, with the twisted to rhyme with south. Mouth, yes, yes. Um, scent of magnolia, sweet and Something to rhyme with the sudden smell of burning. What goes with burning? The collocation, burning flesh, and therefore sweet and something as sweet, sweet and what? I think we know the song. Yes, okay. Anyway, you get the idea. This is a way to test the students' mind schemes, uh, to test the students' feet as well. They're kind of intrigued by the rhyme and also by the collocations. So there's a lot of vocabulary here, all right? Um, well, of course, look up the full version, okay? You can find the full version to see what were the matching um, rhyme schemes, kind of, okay? So, all right, so basically then we go into focusing the keywords. How do I do that? Well, basically I show them um, songs, okay? Uh, what? Okay. So I show them a video, all right? I show them a video of a 75th celebration um, of Strange Fruit. So there were these people who came together and created this video. Um, I sent the link with, uh, in the revised presentation, it's seen them here, I'm not sure. Um, because there was another, there was another um, slide, if I'm not mistaken. Before this, no, okay, no. So sorry about that. Okay, but if you're interested, I will. I will as soon as I'm finished talking, I will give you the link to the video. Okay, um, and basically what I did, I used two sources. Um, uh, one of them was the Billy Holiday song, and the other one was the rap version of the song. And within the rap version of the song, there is a story as well, as well as the photo, which is a bit harrowing. So it's good that they did just see a few seconds of it, not at length, because I didn't want to shock students too much. I, want to, I wanted to bring them out of their comfort zone to remove them from their desensitized state, but I didn't want to shock them too much. And what we did was um, Billie Holiday's performance is actually very slow and places a lot of emphasis on the words. So that was a very good way for them to confirm the meaning, and sorry, to confirm the gaps of the words and to confirm the meanings as well. Yes, it's a very high level of language because my students are ESL learners. So in a way, I have to cater for their level. So this would be like a very high B2 or C1 possibly. 
so advanced learners as well okay um, but of course this idea is just an example you can use lower level poems you can use poems that um, basically have lower level of language uh, and and yeah um, do the same kind of steps uh, this is a sample remember so in reality what you can do is find literature or find texts that are um, like drama, poems, or, or even prose, and somehow blend them with multimodal media, with songs, with images, and with videos. Uh, and in that way, you are really creating a lesson. Here, I'm just using a, an example of how you can create an entire lesson or more based on one resource, and then take it to the next level by including things like video and image, all right? Um, so, and also to, to, to really show them a little bit of an insight into history as well. Um, so in other words, then we went into the key points, the significance of the poem behind, um, the meaning behind it, how it refers and relates to contemporary society and relevant issues today. And this is the interesting part because this, of course, takes us to more than the traditional response beyond the question in, as regards style and effectiveness and meaning, but also um, in relation to very topical concerns in society, such as racism and immigration. Um, and of course, how St. Louis affects them on a personal and social level as well as how to think about our levels of tolerance and acceptance in society. Right, so now this is where I come to the students as co-creators and students as um, using this particular text and this particular video and image that we use in order to prompt them to go off and be creative and respond not necessarily verbally but but also in this way through other visuals now i also had a song that a student produced with an actual producer and what she did was she took the song's lyrics she used them and then she extended the song's lyrics um, she added to the song's lyrics and everyone was transfixed I guarantee she's only 16 and everyone was just mesmerized by this song and they wanted, the students wanted her song on the Spotify playlist, believe it or not. Okay, this picture, this image is a photo, is, is a painting. It is drawn by a student, also 16 years of age. And this student doesn't have any um, art lessons. She never took art lessons and she doesn't draw. But I told them, now you're going to respond to the poem in whatever way you think best. Um, you can, for example, draw. I didn't really tell them to draw, but they, you know, I just said an example. I said, you can, you can create a PowerPoint, you can write, you can do anything. I didn't tell the student who, who created the song to go ahead and create the song. She was inspired not only by the poem, but also by the video, um, by the rap version, because hers is also a rap version, okay? Um, right, and this is the creative response of one of the students. Another student created a, um, a uh, PowerPoint where she took, um, she, she Googled, so she researched, images of the era she looked into lynching and stuff like that and racism and the us and then she also found um the nso statistics from immigration today and she juxtaposed two different um eras two different periods in history where black people are subjected to uh racist or in you know um in so some ways they're subjected to to, to inhuman behavior and human treatment. And she played, she, she also used multimodal um, visuals of her own because she used PowerPoint, she used visuals, she used text, 
and she used music because she embedded the song Zombie by Cranberries throughout the PowerPoint presentation. Um, right, so basically this is, yes, a student, one for content-centered generated content, yes. And in fact, for further classroom, I wanted to say that because what we did, this is the rough version, yes, you can copy, um, you can copy the, uh, the link. That is the um, video that I found on YouTube. Okay, you can copy it. And I'll explain to you something I, else I did with the students for further classrooms. Okay, um, where students also became student agents of the classroom and co-creators of the lesson. Uh, so whilst you're copying that from the screen, or you can take a screenshot of the link, all right, um, and then you can listen and view the video in your own time if you're interested. Right, um, what I did was the following. I said, okay, today we discussed an issue which was uh, something to do with racism and intolerance and human treating someone else in a bad way. So then I told them, now you're going to take another social issue that speaks to you. This really, really, really is at heart, you know, close to your heart. I didn't tell them what to do, just I narrowed it down again. The focus was poems with social issue, with social communication, uh, with something that is current as well. And the response was incredible. Students went off and came back the next session and they brought poems to class, but not only poems. Some of them brought poems and videos. Some of them brought poems, videos and PowerPoint presentation. And what do I mean by poems and videos? Because some students told me they like listening and viewing performance poetry, like poetry slams. And uh, I can recall one example. A student brought um, a poem to class, uh, which is called Explaining Depression to My Mother by Sabrina Benaim. And then the student read the poem, the other students, because I put them into groups, I told, I told the groups of four to five students, uh, you have uh, a group in which you have four to five different poems because everyone managed to bring a different poem. No one overlapped, it was incredible. And they were in that session reading four to five different texts on different subjects, social subjects like domestic abuse, bullying, depression, self and identity, um, there were more, what are those? Ah, oh, yes, the idea of freedom and being who you want to be. Um, did you then use resources for a class? Yes, what I did was I used the poems that they brought to class and we somehow compiled a poetry bank. And I told them, now I'm going to group the poems that you brought to class with you uh, in order for me to create a poetry bank. And then I made poetry bank available on VLE, which is our virtual learning environment. So whenever students wanted to read a poem for more, uh, you know, for their own cultural uh, growth as well, and sensitization of social issues, they would log into the system and find the poem suggested by other students. Uh, and students were actually learning about poetry slam and performance poetry, and they were getting to know new poets as well, who are young and um, not only male, but poets who are also female. Because our students were always used to the idea, unfortunately, that poets were always Anglo-Saxon dead white men. Sorry, not to be um, sort of in any way um, kind of saying anything um, wrong, but that was the cultural uh, canon of the time, you know, the cultural, um, the, the, the literary canon. Um, so no, I don't want to offend any British people out there, but their students are exposed to Anglo-Saxon culture. So we wanted to expose them. I wanted to expose them to something a bit, um, a bit different. And when they brought to class uh, female poets, um, young uh, in their age bracket, kind of in their 20s, they would say, oh, poets are young and female, you know, so they had a new voice. Right, and um, so from being to doing, students became agents in their own classroom and they lead the conversation of the topic. So to, 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 to uh, conclude, 
the image, the poem, video, and song. This is how Marty Model works, the cycle. And I like to leave you with a thought now to demystify the taboos and boundaries, to sensitize teens and young adults to different changing realities. Okay, this is basically the idea of connecting and making multimodal media work in discussions on central issues, not just language. But language is at the center. And finally, should we avoid or embrace discussions on certain social issues which are considered taboo? Okay, Stephanie, thank you. Thank you. That was really good. It's great to see, you know, bringing in social issues like that creates such a, a great response from the students. So thanks very much for your talk. Um, we're going to have a short break now and we'll be back in five minutes with the next session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Over to you. Bye-bye.